Hi, I'm WTOP film critic Jason Fraley, and all month long we're ranking the best movies in every genre. 30 genres over 30 days, and today we break down my favorite war flicks. Now, of course, when you think of war flicks, you first of all think of the war movies that are about the front lines, the actual men and women in battle. So we get classics like the 1930 Lewis Milestone, All Quiet on the Western Front. This was, to me, the first great talky, a uh, talking war picture. Um, it's an anti-war movie about uh, down in the trenches of World War I and that great final shot with his hand reaching for the butterfly and it, the hand uh, drops dead. Um, but go back and look at it. I think this one sort of pioneered, uh, not just for sound films, but for, for editing and, and war films in general um, with all the extras running across the fields. Uh, all Quiet on the Western Front is a must. Uh, we also get The Battle of Algiers. Um, it is uh, Ponte Corvo's movie in the mid-60s. Um, and it's all about the, the insurgency, and it, it was actually such a, a powerful um, look at insurgency that U.S. military commanders showed it to our troops uh, before they went into the, the war in Iraq because they knew that, well, <laughs> I think they underestimated the insurgency, but still, like they, it was such a great um, look at, at how that even unfolds with the guerrilla warfare and that, those sort of tactics uh, that they showed this masterpiece. If you've never seen it, um, oh my God, it almost feels like a documentary because it's got that cinema verite style, but Ponte Corvo nailed it. Battle of Algiers, check it out. Um, we also get movies like uh, Patton, um, one of my father's favorite flicks and of a certain generation and fathers and grandfathers are gonna harken back to this because it is the ultimate World War II general uh, George Patton played in an Oscar-winning turn by George C. Scott, that great opening scene where he walks up in front of the big uh, American flag um, and delivers the, those great, <laughs> that great speech, that great monologue. Um, written, uh, a lot of people forget, the script was written, Oscar-winning script written by Francis Ford Coppola uh, just two years before he made The Godfather and launched into his own directing career. He started as an Oscar-winning screenwriter for this, uh, for Patton, which was directed uh, by Franklin Schaffner, who had made Planet of the Apes two years earlier. So a lot of great Hollywood talents coming here. Yeah, it could have been biopics, um, but we decided to put it in here with the war flicks because every time I catch it on cable, you think, oh, that's one of the great war flicks. Um, we also get movies like Platoon. Uh, now we're moving into Vietnam a little bit. Um, but this was the first movie made about Vietnam made by an actual Vietnam vet. So Oliver Stone fights in the war and comes home uh, and becomes a filmmaker and, and thinks, oh my gosh, uh, I'm going to show the horrors of Vietnam uh, from my own experience. So that's really powerful stuff. Um, the cast here, you forget how many, I mean, it launched so many careers. Charlie Sheen, Willem Dafoe, Tom Berenger, um, Johnny Depp, um, Glover from um, in Living, Living Color, the, the rap group, he's in the movie. Um, I think uh, Forrest Whitaker, Keith David, so many people came from that movie. Um, but what haunts in my mind are the shots of sort of the big bombed out craters and dead bodies, um, or even some of the troops um, swatting off the little straw hats almost really um, offensively. And, and Charlie Sheen's kind of looking in horror um, to that great score, Adagio uh, of Strings by Samuel Barber. That music will give you goosebumps or take you right back to that movie. And uh, man, it's, it's just really powerful stuff. Um, then we also, along similar lines, another anti-Vietnam movie, uh, Full Metal Jacket. Stanley Kubrick, it's a masterpiece, and it feels almost like two different movies. It opens, the first half is Arlie Ermey, rest in peace, recently died. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's almost like a comedy. You get Arlie Ermey doing that, that drill sergeant. I'm Gunnery Sergeant Hartman um, doing all those great one-liners, which I can't really repeat here about garden hoses and golf balls and things like that. Uh, show us your war face. Uh, but it, it's, you're laughing out loud um, as he's picking on all these troops and giving them these nicknames. Um, but man, does that movie turn on a dime um, when, when Private Pyle snaps uh, in the bathroom scene. Um, and all of a sudden, we're saying, what? the heck and suddenly we get the Nancy Sinatra din din da dun dun da dun dun da dun dun da these boots are made for walking as we're dropped into um, Vietnam with you know the lovely long time the famous quoted scene and we're like oh my god what happened and the rest is a horrific look at war and what it does um, on the mankind psyche and there's a, even a line in it where that still gives me chills um, they say how can you shoot women and children and they say easy just don't lead them so much and you're like Oh my God, where, what are we doing with the horrors of war? Um, we also get Glory, uh, the Civil War. Um, this movie is, um, 
I think it doesn't get enough credit. Um, a lot of people mention it, but I think I'd put it higher. Denzel won uh, the Oscar for supporting actress and or supporting actor with that great scene, um, heartbreaking scene where um, he's he's getting lashed and you see all the the whip marks on his back and just that single teardrop that comes down his face. Um, you've seen that in a million memes on Twitter, but one of Denzel's best performances and he's so young at this, but it's just a heartbreaking scene. Obviously, hearkening back to slavery, which is the power of this movie because you have the first all black regiment of soldiers fighting for the Union Army, literally fighting for their own freedom. So talk about stakes. Like, yeah, all war movies have stakes, but in this particularly, and not to mention you get Denzel and Morgan Freeman in the same uh, movie. How awesome is that? How, how often does that happen in that scene where they're clapping, doing like the, the spirituals around the campfire before the big battle with, oh my Lord, 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 Lord. It's so good stuff. Um, we get Das Boot, Wolfgang uh, Peterson's uh, chilling look at a German U-boat during World War II. A lot of the stuff um, in Dunkirk was pulled for that. Of course, Dunkirk, uh, Christopher Nolan, a really recent one from last year um, that sort of fractured the narrative in three different timelines. I think we do uh, a, a week, what is it, an hour in the air with Tom Hardy, uh, a week at sea with Mark Rylance, and a, or a day at sea with Mark Rylance, and a week on the beach with Kenneth Branagh and Harry Styles. Uh, but it's crazy how Nolan fractures that. He always does that with Memento. He always fractures it. Um, and then newer ones. Uh, I had to get Catherine Bigelow's movies on here. Um, the first... Woman to win Best Director, she up, she beat her ex-husband James Cameron, who made Avatar, with her war movie, uh, The Hurt Locker. Um, it was a great movie. Again, that cinema verite style, um, gritty, almost documentary feel, where Bigelow, I mean, that's how she likes doing her action sequences. Um, and that really powerful um, scene in the end where Jeremy Renner gets home to the grocery store, and it's so eerily quiet that he just doesn't know what to do. It's sort of that PTSD thing, and he just wants to get redeployed. Um, it just shows how civilian life is so hard to transition back to. Um, but to me, I, I know Hurt Locker won Best Picture, but my favorite Catherine Bigelow is Zero Dark Thirty. Um, I wanted to put that in my top ten because I think, yes, it got acclaim at the time, but I, not enough for me. Um, it was Bigelow reuniting with screenwriter Mark Bowl from Hurt Locker, but Man, the stuff they do in that. Look, when, there's a scene when a, a U.S. jeep is going up to a, um, a compound, um, I guess in Afghanistan, where they think where, where they think they're they're going to strike a deal, um, but instead there's a car bomb that blows up, and it's actually based on a real life situation where a bunch of CIA agents were killed. Um, but watch Bigelow as it's driving up, and the characters are all happy. Yay, we're going to have a, a meeting. Bigelow has a black cat walk across the screen. So if you're actually paying attention to the mise en scène around there, Bigelow saying. This is this meeting's doomed, but mostly, I mean, there's all this. To me, it's that 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 final night vision la raid on Osama bin Laden's uh, compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. It reminds me of sort of like the Sons of the Lambs night vision lair, except here we have a different badass woman uh, orchestrating it. Jessica Chastain, that she won the Globe for this role um, as the I'm. The, they're like, who are you? And she's uh, uh, James Gandolfini's Liam Panetta says, who are you? And he, she says, I'm the mother blank who killed bin Laden. Um, so yeah, I mean, she's so great and she's done so many great roles since then, but I think she's a treasure. I think Kat, um, Jessica Chastain is one of the coolest actresses ever and I don't know how she didn't win an Oscar for this or anything since, but um, you get Jessica Chastain, Jason Clark is the guy doing the interrogating, the torture tactics, um, and then you get Joel Edgerton and Chris Pratt, yeah, Star-Lord as the Navy SEALs that go on the raid, not to mention James Gandolfini um, as Panetta uh, right before he died, Tony Soprano. It is stacked. Go go check it out. But my favorite final point, the music is what makes it. Watch the listen to the music as the helicopters take off to go to Abbottabad to the Bin Laden compound. And it's that Oh, it's one of my favorite recent scores. Zero Dark Thirty, a must. Now those are the movies on the front lines, but I also wanted to include movies from the sidelines, which is where uh, maybe this list, my list, might differ from other uh, war lists. Um, there's other more patri other big frontline patriotic movies you could put on um, that you might not see here on your list in the re this list because, and the reason is. I thought it was important to include at least half or, or a, good, a third, a good chunk of, of the list with movies about the effects that war have on the home front or even on military bases, but not on the front lines. I think, I think it's equally important because um, what does war do to us? Um, I think it's important to look at the families. So we have movies um, like um, 
Born on the Fourth of July, where Tom Cruise comes home um, and and protests the Vietnam War. We have movies like Coming Home, Hal Ashby's movie with John Voight and uh, Jane Fonda, also a, a, a romance um, on the home front of Vietnam. Um, of course, The Deer Hunter, which to me um, I had to put in my top five. Man, yes, there's those scenes with the Russian roulette um, in Vietnam, uh, but. That's only a small chunk of the movie. Most of it, the whole first third is like that wedding sequence with the guys, you know, getting ready to go off to war with some symbolic blood dripping at the wedding, foreshadowing. And then there's the, the Viet Cong um, Russian roulette stuff that's horrific. I mean, Christopher Walken and De Niro like screaming at each other as they put the bullet in the chamber and spin it around. And oh, it's so chilling. But honestly, the most powerful is the whole final third or half almost of the movie where they come home. Um, and you have John Savage as, you know, the, the wheelchair-bound uh, veteran of Vietnam and De Niro and Christopher Walken dealing with PTSD and De Niro, you know, falling for, for Meryl Streep, um, underrated Meryl Streep role. Um, but there's a lot more going on to it. Take a look at this movie. Look at the, even there's a sort of an idea of there's a love child here, but they think it's one person's, but it actually is someone else's. If you look, he has blonde hair um, during the final funeral. There's a whole cool underlying story uh, involving Walken. Check it out. Um, also, um, on, if you want to talk sidelines, that includes like MASH, um, Robert Altman's um, early gem that inspired the entire TV series that still is the top most watched finale ever, the TV show. Um, but this movie was 1970, and this is on, I could have put it at the sideline subgenre because... Uh, you know, these are these are Korean War medics. Um, and yes, it's kind of a comedic in a lot of ways, but also horrific. And Altman even has, he re restages The Last Supper, the, that imagery, except it's all them on the medical operating table uh, in the Korean War. Check that out. We also get From Here to Eternity, Best Picture 53, um, where um, we're on the, the barracks over in Pearl Harbor before that attack happens. Uh, we remember the big, the big blockbuster Pearl Harbor movie where it opened with the big combat and then it's Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett trying to you know figure it out after that. But no, I think the, this one's so powerful is because we get to meet and fall in love with all these characters knowing that that Pearl Harbor is going to happen at the end. They save it for the climax, Fred Zinneman did. So it's pretty good. And the cast, oh my God. Monty Clift playing the trumpet, playing taps. For Frank Sinatra, we got Ernest Borgnine. We have Burt Lancaster and Deborah Carr kissing in the waves uh, in Hawaii outside Pearl Harbor. That's one of the most iconic images ever. Um, from here to eternity, I think it's a little underrated. Check it out. And then, of course, uh, a trio of movies that I guess are kind of on the sidelines, but foreign flicks that if there's some of your big more, you know, Ameri if this was a list of American movies, I'm sure other ones would have made the list. Um, but I had to bump them because I wanted to include some foreign films, um, including um, Wajda's Polish flick uh, Ashes and Diamonds, which unfolds on the last day of World War II. There's these people that are left after the last day, after the war ends. Uh, we get Rome Open City by um, Roberto Rossellini, started his war trilogy. Um, that he went on, Rossellini went on to marry Ingrid Bergman and they birthed Isabella Rossellini of Blue Velvet. Um, but Rossellini is a, a pivotal figure in film history. We had to include him. And this is, this is shot in 1945, Rome Open City. It is the launch of the Italian neorealist movement. This is literally, there's German, actual German uh, soldiers, Nazi soldiers going through the streets and they film this. It's called Italian neorealism because they filmed it with hidden cameras, non-actors, real locations in the actual bombed out uh, Rome, open city, um, catching actual German soldiers as the villains of the movie, like with hidden cameras. Come on, that's crazy. Um, and then, of course, Hiroshima, Hiroshima Mon Amour, Alan Renee's debut, um, all about the the effects of total war, where we see uh, the you know obviously the U.S. dropped atomic bombs and. Um, we see Emmanuel Riva fall for a Japanese architect and their, their love affair, but it all has them. It all plays on the backdrop of the ashes of Hiroshima, and there's sort of that surrealist opening with their 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 romancing, but their naked bodies are covered in ashes symbolically. Underrated, bizarre movie, French New Wave movie, avant-garde. Had to get it on here for Rene. Now, of all those great movies, the top three uh, were no-brainers for me. Number three. The best years of our lives. So this sort of is on the sidelines. This is about what happens when our troops come home from World War II. We get Frederick March, um, Dana Andrews, uh, Harold Russell. They cast an actual, um, actual World War II vet who had lost both of his hand, arms and hands and uh, were replaced with hooks. 
He won Best Supporting Actor and a second Oscar, an honorary Oscar for, you know, like a, a military hero of acting in a movie. He, I think he's the only one to win two Oscars for the same role. It's kind of cool. Um, but this movie, it won Best Picture in 1946 over It's a Wonderful Life, um, which is one of my favorite movies. But I think, and Anne Horner Day of the Post agrees, we, we both are like, we got to hold this movie up. Best Years is, it beat Wonderful Life for a reason because it's, oh my God, it, it should be held up in that same stature. So early talking about PTSD and, you know, literally veterans waking up in, in cold sweats from their, their memories. And this is 1946. This is right after World War II. William Wyler crafts an epic masterpiece. There's great romances with Teresa Wright and Myrna Loy and everything, too. But, man, talk about the early, early um, clarion call um, to let's, let's take care of our veterans and their PTSD. Um, best scene is when Frederick March comes home and his wife... Her, her back's turned to us. She's like, who is it? Who is it? I hear someone there. And then you just see her, you see her stiffen up. And it's from behind her. You see her just stiffen up. And she knows that her husband's home. And she turns. And they have this big embrace. And their kids are watching. And it's one of my, it tears me up every time. One of the best movies and moments in movies. Number two, the best World War II movie ever. Back to the front lines. Saving Private Ryan. Steven Spielberg's 1998 masterpiece. He won Best Director for the second time after Schindler's List. And... Man, uh, that opening scene where the D-Day invasion on the beaches of Omaha with the artillery fire and the boats coming up onto the beach and Tom Hanks is going sort of in, there'd be an explosion that goes off and the sound goes out because it's ringing in his ear but it's in slow motion and he's struggling to pick up his bloody helmet or there's, you know, a body, dra a half, a body he's trying to save but the lower torso is blown off or... Uh, he turns to tell the guy next to him um, up going up the hill and his face caved in. It is, there's so many moments that just stick with you during that opening or just the camera like going under the water as the bullets are going. Um, and that's just the first like 15, 20 minutes. That alone deserved Best Director Oscar. Um, but then you also get the sniper scene where, you know, Caparzo, uh, Vin Diesel gets sniped and they have to take out the sniper. Barry Pepper, the sniper, has to. Um, and there's Tom Sizemore and all the great cast. Um, but um, later, uh, and then the, bridge, the final bridge sequence, too, where he tells Matt Damon, earn this. We can't forget that the whole thing is we're, we're trying to save one man. We're trying to save Private Ryan, and it's Matt Damon. Um, it's just one of the great war movies ever, that great patriotic opening and closing at the cemetery. Um, it really reminds us of that, you know, some made the ultimate sacrifice, and Saving Private Ryan is, is a must. You could have easily put it one on the list. But for me, I put number one, Apocalypse Now. Um, I just think the filmmaking in this is so amazing by Francis Ford Coppola. It came at the end of a, a, a meteoric decade for him, Godfather 1 and 2 and The Conversation and all those great movies. Um, Patton, we mentioned, he wrote the script. But this sort of zapped, 1979, at the end of the decade, zapped his creative talents forever, a lot of people say. That's a little harsh. He's made some decent movies since then, some good ones too. But um, he was never the same as he was during, like, the master genius of the 70s. And, I mean, go back, watch film, uh, Hearts of Darkness, A Filmmaker's Apocalypse, documentary that his wife made during the making of the movie. There were typhoons that ruined sets. Uh, Marlon Brando showed up overweight and not knowing his lines as Colonel Kurtz. Dennis Hopper, who's playing a drugged out, you know, photographer, is actually showing up, like, on acid and high out of his mind. Um, Martin Sheen, who's the main character here, um, had a heart attack on set. And there's even that scene where he's, they actually had him get drunk um, in his hotel room, Saigon, I'm still in Saigon, um, where he like karate chops a mirror and actually cuts his bloody hand and they just kept rolling and he's drunk and he's smearing it everywhere. Like the movie was a uh, hellacious to shoot over budget, um, but what a movie. It opens with the, him looking at the ceiling fan and you hear the sound of helicopter blades as it's going around. Um, merch editing is amazing. Even the beginning with the door, it begins with, this is the end. <laughs> the movie begins with the end. The door is singing, this is the end, uh, as they drop the napalm and, and blow up all the trees. And then, of course, the Ride of the Valkyries with uh, Robert Duvall. Dun, 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 going up. I mean, that's so iconic. And then he gets on the beach and says, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. It smells like victory. 
Um, but as we go further and further down the river, it becomes a young Forrest Whitaker uh, or a young um, Lawrence Fishburne um, in his first role um, as a doomed teenager, you know, out there surfing to uh, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, all the rock and roll soundtrack. But he comes almost like an acid trip down the river. It's based on Comrades Hearts of Darkness, and, except placed in the Vietnam War. And as we further go down the river, we lose our mind and slowly go insane um, until the big final finale that almost is mind blowing and so bizarre where we intercut the slang of Kurtz with the ritualistic uh, chopping of the, the calf, uh, the, the cow. Um, so much genius directing here. Um, thankfully, they edited it down with the Redux version <laughs> that is, makes it more palatable of like three hours as opposed to like 20 hours or whatever they shot. But man, it is, it is, a, mass, is a masterful piece of work. Yes, you could have put Private Ryan number one. I wanted to put Apocalypse Now as number one almost as a message. Um, I think because it's uh, war, war is insane and brings out the worst in us. Um, so number one, Apocalypse Now, the most important war movie of all time. See my full top 25 war movies on WTOP.com's entertainment page. Join the blog and let us know what you think. And tune in tomorrow for the last one, my favorite westerns of all time.